Listen, uh, we're going to have a support group uh, for those uh, longtime listeners who need a little bit of help getting over the whole StreamYard snafu. But come on in. I'm going to get us live on the Facebook. So, Brian, I'm going to have to talk to the marketing team and get them to, uh, you know, start disseminating the podcast manually again, since uh, that was the one thing that StreamYard actually knows how to do is to pump it into multiple locations at the same time, except they can't except the chat was screwed up, right? Fun, fun stuff. Yes. So, oh, not page, pro timeline, here we go. There we go, just pushing it to my follow-up boss. All right, so we got people coming in, Brian, we got 16 people in here, actually 14, two of them are us. Gotcha. Well, they're coming in slowly. People will come in. I, I think maybe we lost some audience by switching to that. So we'll have to rebuild our audience as we come back to that. I think we actually hit 100 a couple of weeks ago. So uh, yeah, wasn't that amazing? Uh, so we got people coming in. Uh, we're streaming to follow up boss now. Uh, Dale Archdeacon, Brian Curtis back again for cash call. Another riveting week. Uh, we're so glad that we got rid of StreamYard. And we're back to Zoom, which is much easier to use, right? And so, yes, we we only have a few people watching live or people that are watching within Zoom. So why don't you guys, let's see if chat is working. Because the chat, historically, we had some issues with it being disabled also. Let's see what the settings are. Uh, attendees can chat with everyone. There we go. All right. So if you are on here right now, chat and say, hey, hello, tell us hi. We want to see that you're here. There we go. Oh, well, that's Will. Will's a plant. Will's from the marketing department. There we go. Peter Barons. Hello, Peter. Emily Riley. Good. So we got people. We're connected. Excellent. All right. Good. So I have a really great call today, Brian. I don't know if anybody here uh, on Cash Call at least has heard what our I have an agent uh, pattern is that we teach, right? So I do webinars on this stuff. I do it for follow up boss and Red X and Real Geeks and all that sort of stuff. And so people have definitely heard uh, our own I have an agent pattern that we teach. And it's basically four steps, right? It's four questions that we ask. And the first one is just a paraphrase, right? So um, somebody says some version of I have an agent, right? I'm working with somebody or somebody sending me listings, or I've been out to see stuff, or even I've seen so and so's billboard, and I think I'm going to work with them, right? So the first thing you do is paraphrase, typically, you just paraphrase back whatever they said, the way that they said it. And to make it simple, I would just say, Oh, you have an agent, right? As a question, you notice I went up on the end of that. So it's a paraphrase, right? And it's going to solicit information or answers from them that I don't have to figure out the question to ask. Yeah, that's typically how a paraphrase works. And they're going to give me free information. Yeah, they really, they really will. Yeah. And then you go on to these next three questions, which would be, are you committed to that agent? Have you signed anything with that agent? And some variation of what's the benefit to working with that agent or what's the uh, advantage to working with that agent over any other agent in the market. So that four-step pattern we're going to hear in this call, and this guy really demonstrates it well. Uh, nice. and, and I also want to point out a couple of things. So let me let me get into playing the call. I'm going to share my screen. Isn't it so much easier to like share your screen inside Zoom? It is. So much easier. Uh, all right, so I've got it teed up. Now, I want to set this up. This is a, she's got a budget of 340000 whatever it is. She's already pre-qualified. At the very beginning of the call, she says something about having an agent and having a lender, right? So he does the right thing. He ignores it. He goes on and just gets into discovery. He's having a conversation with her. And here at about four minutes and 16 seconds, it comes back up again, the idea of agent. So I, I want you to tell everybody, Dale, because I think it's an important idea. Why not handle that at the very front end? So actually, here's what we do. We teach, what we teach is that uh, there's two ways to go about, or there's two different scenarios. In this scenario, the mention or the idea of agent wasn't a conversation stopper, okay? The information was revealed but the lead wasn't trying to stop the conversation as a result of it. So in that case, you ignore it, you keep on going, you develop rapport, you unpack them. And I suggest that if it comes back around in the conversation, or you know, generally speaking, you're gonna want to take care of it at some point because it's Definitely. still there, yeah. Now, 
if he had been hit up front, if it was like, uh, you know, hey, Brian, this is Dale, blah, blah, blah. Looks like you want to see houses. And Brian said, oh, hey, thanks, man. I appreciate the call, but I have an agent I'm working with. If the lead's trying to stop the conversation, then you have to deal with it, right? You got to yeah. talk about it at that point. I think you agree yeah, with that. 100%. And what I want to say is don't create an objection where one doesn't exist. And also it's really, you know, my, and I think Dale would agree with this. My step one of every conversation is build rapport. Well, if I'm 12 seconds into a conversation and I have to overcome an objection, I don't have rapport. I just don't. Right. I mean, we, we might be start to build it. So if it's not something that seems like it's going to stop the conversation, like Dale said, nope, I got an agent. I don't need to. OK, well, now I've got to deal with it. But if I don't have to deal with it, build some rapport and come back to it, they may find out that they like you better. And yeah. it'd be a lot less easy. It'd be a lot less challenging to deal with. So yeah. I just wanted to point that out because I think. People always want to deal with an objection right away. And, and there's good times to do that. And there are times you absolutely have to do that. But use your judgment in, in some of these situations. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So this came back up again around 416. So we're going to play it. And I want you to hear him go through the process with this person and how it sounds. Oh, OK. So and when you say your realtor, are you talking about the builder's realtor? Or do you have somebody that you're working with privately? Someone I'm working with privately. Oh, okay. And are you committed to that agent? Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. Have you signed anything with that agent? No, like like what? I'm paid percent and I'm only going to use you or something? Right. No. Nope. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Nope. And what, what do you see as the benefit to working with that agent? Um, she just been with me since, really since everything I've, I've been going through. Like I've been trying to get in the house and then like cops appeared on my account. I had to get that taken care of. All right, so I just wanted to play that. He executed it really well. Uh, so here's what goes on. After that, he didn't go in for the kill, right? Like a, will you work with me or anything like that? Because what she basically said is, you know, the agent, uh, she knows I'm really picky. She knows what I'm looking for. She said something about she knows I have a caviar taste and a and a, and a beef budget, right? And, and laughed at, about that. And then then he went on, and this is a good thing to do also is after that he said well what is it that you are looking for in the agent that you work with and then she started wow. telling the qualities that she wanted in an agent right and so then they continue on and obviously the, the call is 18 minutes and 43 seconds long so now he has this p she's not she hasn't committed to only working with him as a result of this conversation but she's open to working with him as well and they're setting appointment to go you know to go out and look at home so here, he's been able to make that turn, make that connection, and then deal with that process in the middle and come out with a really great call and a piece of business, where otherwise he might have either quit, which I hear a lot of agents or ISAs do when that gets mentioned, right? Oh, hey, well, let me know if that doesn't work out with the other agent, right? Or even trying to argue with her about how they should work with me instead of that other agent, but he didn't do any of that stuff. Just by unpacking her, hearing her out, getting the rapport, going through the process that we teach, she naturally liked him and wanted to continue on working with him, which is great. Yeah, and and I love that. And so this is a thing I hear all the time. So why are you calling me then? <laughs> like, but I mean, I've heard it. You've heard it, right? I, I've and, heard and I, it, yeah. <clears throat> I understand the agent's frustrated. I understand they paid money for that lead or whatever. And they're like, man, I was all excited. And usually it happens like five minutes into a conversation because you're like, oh, I want to buy this. And, I'm, you know, they're perfect. You're like, man, this is the greatest lead ever. And then we ask some version of, do you have an agent? And then all the all the wind comes out of the sales. Right. So, but going through this, it's not about killing. It's not about like, let's get it killed. It's about being subtle. It's about being influential. And, you know, at the end of the day, if a person does say, no, like, you know, Brian, he's a great agent. I want to keep working with him. Man, I completely respect that. If you don't mind, I'm just going to follow up with you every couple of weeks because sometimes things change. So there's a reason the person's on the phone with you, though. And understand that. I want to cover one other thing before we move on to the next is a lot of people, when we go over stuff like this, like you're stealing that other client, the other agent's client. No, I'm not. First of all, they don't have a signed contract. Second of all, why the hell are they on the phone with me? Um, at some point in time, either this person's a wild card and you probably don't want them anyway, or the agent didn't train them. 
And by the way, you need to train your clients. Call me when you have any questions. You see any house that you want, call me. If you talk to anyone to let them know you're working with Brian Curtis, like you want to be ahead of this stuff. And we, I hate to say it, but we got to train our clients so that we're not on the, so that your client is not on the other end of Dale's conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, you know, me personally, this one's a little bit close because of, and I listened to it, right? Like how much she describes how long the, the, the agent's been working with her, that she's been really patient, been doing this, been doing that. And, you know, uh, at the end of the day, it's a business decision. Um, I, after having listened to it, the guy executed it really well. He did a great job you know, I might not have tried to steal that piece of business, but, you know, it, I think it just depends, you know. Yeah. And, and I guess what Dale and I are both saying is just use your judgment. Like if you feel like somebody spent the last three months showing this person property, holding their hand, getting them with the lender, working on their credit, I'm probably not going to steal that person. This, this person's earned that. But they showed me one house three weeks ago and I haven't heard from them since. That's oh, yeah. my client now, you know, yeah. and, and, and by the way, you got to figure out where in between you're willing to draw that line, you yeah. know, to Dale's yeah. point, I probably wouldn't have stole this one. I would have probably eventually said, look, I'll follow up with you in a couple of weeks. or for whatever reason, that's not working out, then, you know, I just want to check in on you. But yeah. realistically, I'm probably not stealing that client either. Yeah. And, and I don't want to take anything away from this salesperson because they did an excellent job, right? They executed really well. And it's in a beautiful uh, demonstration of our techniques. Um, but you know, at the, at, for me personally, I like to honor the other professionals in my industry. And if they're doing a good job, if they're working hard for somebody, like we all know how tough this job is. Right. And, and, and it can be pretty thankless sometimes, and you do a lot of work for no pay. Uh, so, you know, if, if somebody's demonstrating to me that that professional is investing in them, then I would, I would let that go. Perfect. Well, I think we're on the same page. Yeah. Well, I've got a call if you'd like me to play it. Um, I think it's a good call. Um, hopefully I won't be proven wrong. There's some errors, like, but that's going to be true in every single <clears> phone call. Like I always. can play every one of my phone calls and I guarantee you can find something that you screwed up in it. So we're not saying that that's the case, but uh, I think this is an overall good call. And I think we, we can, there's some things to be learned from it. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And I know how to do this because we're using Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Give me a thumbs up if you hear my sound. Hi, Dusan. Hi. Morning. Hey, with the Curtis Realty Group. I'm a local realtor here in Northwest Arkansas. How are you this morning? Good, good. How are you doing? Doing good, man. Hey, uh, they said you wanted to schedule a showing for uh, 1070 Boardwalk this morning. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm in town for just a couple of days, and tomorrow morning I'm leaving. So I was hoping. I want to point out the thing that I'd like about this call on the front end. Um, he did try and say the guy's name. I didn't like that. We couldn't hear that because I was editing. I don't want our agent to get exposed, if you will. <laughs> that being said, he did a good job of pretty much saying, hey, you want to go see the property. And when you're dealing with lower funnel leads, Realtor.com, Zillow, sign calls, ask them if they want to go see the property. And he did that. And I think that's yep. really important. All too often, we get caught up trying to do a bunch of stuff. Give the person what they want, which is to go see the house. Hoping I can see it sometime today. I mean, it's it's up to you. It doesn't have to be the the, the time that I requested, but you know, sometime okay. today. Sure. Um, could we do? Let me look at my calendar real quick. Sure. My morning is pretty full, but I could probably do like early afternoon, like one o'clock. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, that would be great, actually. Yes. Perfect. So let me get it requested for one o'clock, and let me take a look at the MLS real quick just to see just to make sure that they don't have any funky showing instructions or anything. So this is where I think an error was made. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the main reason I think an error was made is because he just told this guy he's not the listing agent. Right. Yeah. And, if, the, and again, if the guy's paying attention, he'll pick up that he's not the listing agent. <clears throat> right. Now, again, the guy didn't ask. He didn't lie. There was nothing that, that went on. But if someone's really paying attention, they might go, hey, I thought I was talking to the listing agent. So again, not remotely ever suggesting you lie. I'm just saying, don't show all your cards if, if, if it's not time. Yeah, there's a difference between, uh, let me see, let me look this up and see if they have any funky restrictions versus, oh, hey, that sounds great. I'll just make sure it works for the owners. Yep. So yeah. they're both the same thing, but 
in the second example I gave, you're not showing your cards, right? Yeah, and you can use any version of what Dale just said or something along the lines of, hey, I'll get that set up. By the way, if anything comes up, I'll, I'll reach out to you if, if something comes up with the seller. What yeah. if you yeah. don't have to actively make sure everything's perfect? And we all have a tendency to do that. Like, well, I want to make sure I've got them on the phone. I want to check these box. No, no. Remember this simple concept, easy to cancel an appointment, hard to set one. Yeah, and Brian, this also goes back to the thing that we're constantly reminding people about is that this might that might not have capsized this call, right? So I'm assuming the call went on, everything was fine, went water under the bridge, right? So what that does, as we say here a lot of times, is that just hid from this salesperson what kind of error that is and what problem it can cause because he'll get away with it numerous times before he gets tripped up on it. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. So it's funny, when we pay good calls, we have a tendency to be really nitpicky, right? Because yeah. there's an opportunity. Now, what he did, is that going to hurt him on, in 10 phone calls? Is that going to hurt him 10 times? No, but it might hurt him once. And I don't know about you, but I, I like those. I want those extra one or two deals that I didn't, oh, yeah. that I did the absolute right thing to make sure I get them. Why? Because just like everybody else, I'm lazy. I don't want to make extra phone calls. I'm already <laughs> on the phone with this guy. I might as well close him, right? Right. <laughs> so anyway, I'll play a little bit more. Sure. And they said you're interested in some other properties too. Were there other addresses that you might want to take a look at? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, uh, I, I used to live in Northwest Arkansas. I, I moved out to live in Florida now. Uh, okay. And uh, I do have some funds now. Uh, what I wanted to basically do is I wanted to buy. Here's a funny story that really isn't relevant to Cash Call, but it's still a funny story. This guy was my client about oh. 10 years ago. And you notice he said, I do have some funds now. <laughs> the reason he said that is he wasn't able to close last time because he had some financial difficulties after wow. we were under contract. So uh, yeah, it's oh. funny. I recognized the name and I was like, holy crap. That's so. funny. Wait, we have a question here. Jeff C asked, Jeff Carlson asked, would you suggest us saying, let me check with the seller or seller's agent? Absolutely not, Jeff. Hopefully we answered that question by what we talked about. Never, 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 never say that. There's no reason to so, say that. So it's okay to say you, I'm going to check with the seller. Seller, yes, is fine. But generally speaking, I think it's better to do one of the two things that Brian and I did, right? Because it's not check with the seller. I'm. We're just going to yes them. And what I the example I gave was... Um, yeah, that sounds great. I'll just make sure that there's, you know, uh, that that uh, that it works for the seller, right? Or what Brian said was, "Hey, yeah, that's great, and I'll let you know if anything changes." Period. Right? Yeah, but and again, but definitely don't say I'm going to check with the listing agent. I'm going to check with the seller's agent. Do not no. say those. No, no, um, that's no. even check we, with the seller sounds a little official. You know, like aren't you guys connected? Or you know, I mean, if it was like. Hey, can I stop by tonight in about uh, an hour and a half? Hey, I'm, I'm, I'll check with the seller on that one, right? That's yes. that's pretty immediate. But tomorrow yeah, that's noon, three days from now, I don't need to check. I can just yes that. Yep, 100%. So. By uh, uh, one property uh, uh, as an investment and another property for myself as a primary rent. Okay, perfect. And... Um, the other properties that you're interested in, do you know the addresses on those? Uh, you know, uh, I'm interested, you know, in those new constructions, you know, by Roush or, or Mitchell, okay. uh, you know, so one of those. Okay. Any specific area? Are you wanting to stay like around Centerton? Yeah, 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 yeah. My son lives here. He's got a house here. So maybe in, in this vicinity, yeah. Got it. And what's the uh, top of your budget? What's the top of your price range? You're thinking. So for the investment property, you know, uh, it's probably going to be on a lower end, two fifty to sixty. Uh, okay. You know, uh, and for myself, you know, I'll. It depends. Depends what I like, you know, and all of that. But you know, I'm thinking around all anywhere between two seventy and three hundred. You know. Perfect. Okay. Big difference. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, let me um, see if I can get this scheduled today. I know, so on the MLS, it says completion date, uh, March 10th. 
So let me see, first of all, if it's completed and if they're doing showings right now. Okay. Um, looks like they've had it on the market for almost two months. Okay. So I wanted to play that part, and that's kind of where I want to end it. This is the exact thing, the thing that Dale, are saying, Dale and I are saying not to do. Yeah, you don't need to do that stuff. Don't, right. don't, reveal, don't reveal how closely or loosely you are affiliated with that the, the sellers or the builder or whatever it may be. Just yes, whatever you can, get off the phone, go figure it out and come back to talk, you know, have a subsequent conversation if you need to. Right, because I can follow up and say, hey, Dale, you know that house I had to check in. I didn't know what stage of construction we were at. It's a moving, it's a moving you know, target out there with new construction. Not really giving up that I don't know anything about this, but yeah. um, you know, it's really not ready to sell, not ready to look at. But however, I found these three others that were very similar that are a little bit further on in construction. Why don't we take a look at those and give you an idea of what this one's going to look like and also, you know, whatever. But don't put yourself in a box. And right. because in a way he put himself in a box because the guy could have came back and said, nope, I'm, I, I, you know, you're clearly not this, that, or the other. I don't want to work with you. And again, that's, it worked out. That Yeah, that's what Brian and I are talking about. That's the scenario that happens when you uh, sometimes uh, you'll get those people who, when they immediately identify that you are not the authority on whatever property, they'll just go around you. They'll go yes. talk to the seller. They'll go talk to the listing agent. They'll go talk to the builder themselves because you haven't built enough rapport with that person in order to get them to want to work with you specifically in, in the world, typically in the world of sales, uh, when the, in the world of human interaction, right? Uh, the more that somebody gets to know and like you, the more they want to stay with you, the more they want to communicate with you and they don't want to go and have to talk to another stranger, right? Um, the devil that, you know, versus the devil you don't, right? Well, but, yeah. And, you know, if you guys want to think about this, this is a stat that I keep throwing at my team over and over again. 62% of people work, meet, or work with the first agent they meet in person. Think about that. Even if you suck at everything else, if you can be <laughs> the first person, you got a 62% chance. Yeah. Hopefully those, our client, our, our viewers here are surely not people who suck. But my point is. Well, Brian, that explains, that ex that that uh, sheds some light on why there's certain people that are still in the industry who should have failed out a long time ago. Because all they do is get in front of somebody first, right? That's That's how they've managed to stay in the business. Listen, but, not every licensed person is great at their job. We all know that. Yeah. So, and again, I, I know that seems like an extreme statement to talk about, but use every advantage that you can. I mean, why not? If being first is the most important thing to this person, because they're lazy and never going to interview anyone, get in front of them. So, but yeah. don't lose your opportunity to get in front of somebody ever. Like it, it's so powerful to be in front of somebody. And, you know, again, you've heard this, I've heard this. I'm so much better in person. Great. Get in person. <laughs> right. so, That's what most people say. Yeah, so we've been, we've been recently working on um, getting listing appointments set. And a big thing that we teach is, you know, it's pretty obvious that you can set a listing appointment with somebody who's ready to talk to a real estate agent, ready to potentially get their home on the market. That's a no brainer, right? Uh, the yeah. harder ones are, oh, no, we're getting the house ready. We're not quite ready yet. Or, oh, we aren't going to be putting on the market until the fall. And right now we're in the spring, you know, or even... Uh, the the hardest one, which is, yeah, I have no idea whether we're going to sell it or not. And even if we did, it wouldn't be for at least a year or more, right? So those very, those those graduating levels of difficulty for getting in front of people, those are things that we work on. And, and again, the whole purpose is to get in front of as many people as possible. When you have the stat that 62% of those are going to work with that first agent. So even if you aren't putting your house in the market for three months, or six months, or eight months, or a year, maybe. I don't care. If I don't have anything else, if I don't have any other appointments, I want to get in front of you and talk about that house. Yeah, I, I sent a listing appointment one time, like four months out. Nice. I, I love I it. I posted it four months out. They're like, yeah, we're not ready. Well, when are you going to be ready? April. Perfect. April 1st. You know, <laughs> start writing a contract. And Beautiful. does that work every time? Absolutely not. But here's the other thing. Think about this from the list side. I get in front of you, you're six months out. How much yeah. easier is it for me to follow up with you after you and I have met in person? Oh, yeah. And, and I'm not a person that's got, right? I'm oh, a yeah. person who's been to your house, for God's sakes. And that's a very personal thing for most people. Like, I don't invite everybody and their dog over to my house. I manage to get in your house. And that, that shows a ton of value. Oh, yeah. Huge. 
one of the one of the strategies that we teach, uh, uh, you know, in conjunction with get in front of people, right? Even if they aren't ready to list, hey, that's perfectly fine, right? If you can get in there and you can have a conversation with them, even if they are three, six, whatever months out, what you do is because you're in front of them now, you can say, hey, Brian, listen, I, I understand you guys aren't ready to get this property on the market. I understand that. Not ready to be actively marketing it or having people come through and that makes perfect sense. What my clients find really beneficial is if they uh, have me start to build interest in the property even before it's available and before we put it on the internet, but starting to have conversations with potential buyers who aren't ready to buy yet, but will be down the road. And in order for me to do that for you, all I need is written permission to start communicating about your property with those potential buyers. Uh, and then I put my document in front of them that gives me written permission to start talking about their house, right? Which is our listing agreement. And if you do that, and you can do it ahead of time, depending on your market, depending on your MLS, in my market, we just do an MLS waiver that says we won't be advertising. The, the seller says, instructs me that we won't be advertising it in the MLS. And so I have an opportunity to get that thing on paper, even before we're going to be actively marketing it. And, and really what you... If you can do that, if you can position it in a way that makes sense to the seller, who would otherwise be opposed to not ready to list, not ready for buyers to come through my house, hey, totally fine. All I want is permission to be able to start talking to people about your home and that it will be available six months from now. And here's the document that allows me to do that. Yeah. And then you can follow up with this. By the way, if I've got someone who really wants to see it, would you like me to bring them over? Absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no, but either way, you've just increased your chances of locking that piece of business and not losing it in the future. Because Brian, how many times have either us or an agent we're working with been like, oh, I met with them, they were great, they weren't ready, and you know, darn it, they ran, ran into Aunt Susie, who just got her license, and they're going to list with her, right? Yep. or whatever it may, they met so-and-so agent at a barbecue and now I lost that piece of business. Yeah, and remember the law of reciprocity. So if I brought two or three buyers over there who didn't buy in, in, in that month, what's the chance that that person's now going to go with somebody else? Like I've literally bought them, brought them a couple, no, granted they didn't buy, but people aren't stupid. They don't expect one person to walk in their house and rent the contract every time. They're not, yeah. people are, yeah. people are smarter than that. But yeah. I've shown Without even actually listing your house, I can bring you buyers. And the law of reciprocity says, you did stuff for me. I need to do stuff for you. Now, not everybody follows that. Some people are just jerks. I don't know how to say that. But for the most part, you do something for someone, they feel indebted to do stuff for you. So. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I've spoken to Fizbo's who were like, oh, no, we're going to go with such and such agent because they've brought a few buyers by, right? Like I've lost out FISBO listings because another agent had already been proactive in that way and had brought potential buyers through, even though they didn't buy when the FISBO, you know, finally gave up, they went with that agent that had invested that time and had that law of reciprocity. And they should, I mean, why not? They got to prove that he could do something. Right. And yeah, I haven't proven anything. And am I going to fire somebody? Not really fire. I haven't hired him yet who's proven that they can do stuff to hire this hypothetical person I spent a five minute conversation with? Probably not. Right. So, yeah, exactly. you know, bring a value. And, you know, it's, it frustrates me when I first got in the business. I'm sure you've heard this too. A lot of agents kept talking about wasting their time. Well, I'm not going to go show someone until they're pre-approved. That's a waste of my time. I'm not going to go meet with somebody who's that far out. It's a waste of my time. So what are you doing this afternoon? Well, I don't really have anything to do this afternoon. I'm going to hang out at my house because I don't have any business. Hmm. <laughs> so my point is, is that not every conversation that we have turns into a buyer or a seller right now. We got to invest in this thing. And, and those of you who have been licensed for less than three years, I, I can't say this loudly enough. That's what happened in 2020 and 2021 and part of 2022 was that we forgot that we had to nurture people because everyone was doing everything instantly right now. So if you don't understand what's happening because you're relatively new to the market, that's what's happening. That from about 2020, middle of 2020 through the middle of 2022, that was an anomaly. You didn't learn anything in that time period, probably as an agent, except I got to show up really, really, really quick. Right. 
Uh, all right, man, we are out of time. I know that everybody is riveted to their radios or their two-way transistor, whatever they're listening to us on right now, but we have to end for today. We'll be back again next week. Thank you so much for joining us. Brian Curtis, Dale Archdeacon, out for another Cash Call. Thanks, everybody.